Today's video is kindly sponsored by Raycon earbuds. Go to buyraycon.com slash Kendall Ray to get 15% off a new awesome set of earbuds. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another true crime video. So today's case is super, super controversial. I feel like the audience is gonna be pretty split, um, probably more one way than the other. After reading and hearing so many opinions on this case, all over the internet, I am really excited to hear what my audience has to say. This is gonna be another longer one, so let's just go ahead and dive in. So this is Sherry Papini. She was born on June 11th, 1982, making her a Gemini. And growing up, she was pretty close with her family, lived a fairly normal life. And when Sherry was in only seventh grade, she ended up meeting her future husband, Keith Papini. They went on a bunch of dates together at that very young age, and he was her first kiss. I actually think stories like that are really sweet. My grandparents met in like fourth grade, and Josh and I met our senior year of high school, so I love when you kind of meet someone in your childhood and get to grow up together and end up getting married. But it wasn't a straight shot to marriage for them. They actually broke up a few times, and in fact, Sherry ended up getting married to another guy in 2006 named David Dreyfus. But things started to go sour in that relationship pretty quickly and Sherry ended up starting to talk to Keith again. Eventually Sherry and David separated and Sherry moved in with Keith right away and it wasn't until eight months later that her divorce with David was finalized. But Sherry and Keith were really happy to be reconnected and they spent a lot of their time talking about old times, looking at these old notes that they used to write each other that they had saved. They were super happy to be back in each other's lives and in 2009, they had this big fairy tale wedding. And on the outside, they really looked like the perfect couple. So fast forward a bit to 2016 and at this point, they already have two kids together named Violet and Tyler. At the time, they were two and four, so now they would be, what, eight and six? At this time, they were living in Mountain Gate, California in a beautiful area and they actually were living in the house that Keith had grown up in. So very fairy tale like life. Now, even though they took a lot of photos together, they actually weren't active on social media at all and kept their lives very private. Sherry was a full-time mom who took being a mom very seriously and did not want her kids to be out in the public anywhere. So she kept them completely off the internet. According to most media outlets, everyone that Sherry knew really liked her. They thought she was a very good mother. Some people actually described her as a super mom that she wouldn't just make a pie, she'd make the best Martha Stewart pie you had ever seen. She also kept her kids very well groomed and dressed up and was active in all their activities. She just really enjoyed being a mom. So in the fall of that year, 2016, Sherry was starting to run again because she was training for a turkey trot type of run for Thanksgiving. The Papini family lived in a really beautiful neighborhood out in Northern California. And she really liked to go out on runs in this wooded area that had a trail about a mile away from her home. So November 2nd, 2016, completely normal day. Keith says goodbye to Sherry, gives her a kiss, says goodbye to his children and heads off to work. And he is working at Best Buy at this time. Just before 11 a.m., Sherry had texted Keith and asked if he would be coming home for lunch that day. And he responded to her and said, no, sorry, busy day. The kids were at daycare during this time, which is nice for Sherry because she is just home. So she took this time to run. And at 11 a.m., she put on her pink running jacket and headed out. Sherry's neighborhood was really spaced out and very quiet. So not a lot of people would hear you or see you. It was just a very tranquil experience. Whenever she went out jogging, she normally went on the same trail in her neighborhood, which was about a mile away from her house. As she ran, she entered a remote area in Mountain View, California, near Old Oregon Trail and Sunrise Drive. And she's just running along like normal, and then suddenly her vision is obstructed. She can't tell what's going on, but someone had thrown a bag over her head. Before she knew it, she was being pulled into a dark SUV. There were two people abducting her, and one of them had a gun. So Sherry was completely frantic, screaming. They put her in the car and she's gone like that. So later that day, Keith comes home from work like normal around 4.30 p.m. He says that normally his wife and his kids actually come to the door to greet him every day and they have a big family cuddle session. I pulled up, I, uh, I saw our, our car there and I opened the door expecting my son comes 100 miles an hour <laughs> right at me. And then usually uh, Violet right right behind him. We do what we call, you know, our family snuggles. 
<laughs> he tried not to panic, um, so he pulled out his phone and opened up the Find Friends app to see if he could figure out where she was that way. So her phone ends up hanging over near their mailbox, which is actually over a mile from their house, which is kind of crazy. So he gets in the car and drives there as quick as he can, hoping to find her and the kids just checking the mail. This is at the intersection of Sunrise Drive and Old Oregon Trail. And when he pulled up, he did not find Sherry, but he did find her phone with her earbuds and some hair of hers all tangled up in it laying on the ground. And this is when he said he really began to worry. He became convinced that something really bad had happened. Before picking up her phone, he decided to take pictures of it as this was possibly a crime scene. So then he gets in his car and he starts driving around trying to see if he could find her anywhere near that area. When he fails to locate her, he goes ahead and calls 911. Hello, can I help you? Hello? Yeah, um, so uh, I just got home from work, and uh, my wife wasn't there, which is unusual, and my kids should have been there by now from, like, daycare. So I was like, oh, maybe she went on a walk. Um, I couldn't find her, so I called the, the daycare to see what time she picked up the kids. The kids were never picked up, so I got freaked out, so I hit, like, the Find My iPhone app thing, and it said that her it showed her phone, like, at our end of our driveway. We don't have really good service. Okay. Uh, not the end of our driveway, but the end of our street. So I just drove down there, and I saw her phone with her headphones because she started running again. And it's her, I found her phone, and it's got, like, hair ripped out of it, like, in the headphones. So I'm, like, totally freaking out, thinking, like, somebody, okay, like, what's your, grabbed her. Okay, what's your address? I'm at the end of the driveway. Where, uh, I'm at the Old Oregon Trail and Sunrise where they meet because that's right where I found her phone on the ground. You're telling me that something happened to her is the way I'm looking at it. There's, like, then there was hair, like, in the headphones. Like, it got ripped off of, like, the grab. Yeah, no, I, un I understand. I understand. Okay, I'm sorry. I know it's you're okay. trying to keep me calm, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of vehicle are you in? I'm in a black Kia Optima. Keith said that he thought it was possible that she could have just lost her cell phone, but it was really getting to him that the children hadn't been picked up from daycare yet. So the dispatcher tells him to go home and to stay calm and that police will be contacting him shortly. The police came to his house and immediately started the search. Keith was very distraught during this time. He was very concerned about his wife. He made several public pleas and 24 hours turned into 48 hours without her and 48 hours then turned into 72 and soon it was weeks that Sherry was gone. During this time, the case was getting a lot of media attention. The community was very interested and very worried about Sherry. She is considered at risk uh, due to the suspicious circumstances. We're just using a map and we're doing some grid searches. The longer that someone's missing, that's a very critical time within the first, you know, 24 hours. Keith made a public statement to the kidnappers asking for his wife to please be returned, saying that he loved her. And he was definitely, definitely showing emotion this time. He was visibly shaking. You could tell he was absolutely in shock. He was literally sobbing on national TV and a lot of people really, really felt for him. And so the whole social media presence for the case grew as well as media coverage in general. I'm coming, honey, I'm trying. I'm doing everything I can. And uh, I love you. Pretty soon this case actually made it to national and international headlines, which is huge. Most missing persons cases do not get this much attention. There was a massive search for Sherry. Federal, state, and local authorities all were involved. And not only that, there were tons and tons of volunteers who just out of the kindness of their heart volunteered their time looking for Sherry. They tried to cover as much area around the neighborhood that Sherry actually went missing from as they could. And even Keith was out there, you know, physically looking for her, which was really hard for him. And he said that at one point it just hit him that he was probably looking for her dead body. I mean, if you're out looking for a body, chances are you're not looking for someone just like laying there alive. When you're doing that type of physical search on the ground, you know you're looking for a body and it just really hit him. Her children, Violet and Tyler, were obviously kept out of what exactly was happening, but they knew that their mom wasn't there and they were very, very sad. I told him I had something important to tell him and he, he jumped. <coughs> He jumped up on the couch with me and he knew he knew something was up and he said dad you can tell me anything <laughs> for a little four-year-old to say that <laughs> i wasn't prepared for that so i just said uh son you know uh mommy went running and and she could she didn't come home and we're, we're all looking for her right now we just held each other and and i said uh, 
He said, are you looking for it? I said, everybody in the whole world is looking for her right now. <laughs> and uh, I said, we're gonna find her and, and we're gonna get her back. Even though so many members of the community came to search for her and spent hours and hours physically looking, there was absolutely nothing found. No clues, no sherry, nothing. People felt so bad for Keith and their family and really came out in support in the area. They started tying yellow ribbons in remembrance and to spread awareness about her case all over the community, put up signs and posters. But as the weeks went on, there was absolutely nothing to work with, no clues. The police didn't even know where to start. I mean, she was just plucked out of thin air and no witnesses had seen the car, no one had seen it happen. I mean, there was just nothing to work with. And eventually this started to really frustrate Keith. He felt like the police could be doing even more than they were, which I don't know. I mean, they had brought so many resources in, like I said, way more than other missing persons cases get. So I think they were trying as hard as they could. There was just really nothing to go from. And tips were coming in from the community, but they followed through with each of these tips and they just led to nothing. However, eventually Keith started to get so frustrated that he created his own team of friends that could help investigate the case and look for Sherry. And they had their own little meeting room in his house and investigation headquarters. Kind of. Keith at this point also started a GoFundMe account so that they could possibly hire a private investigator and fund whatever else that they needed for the search. And eventually they hired a private investigator named Cody Salfin to help find Sherry. And at this time, Keith was still working with the police, but the relationship was definitely starting to become a little strained and the police felt like Keith making so many statements and doing his own investigation could possibly compromise their investigation. But because this case was so confusing, Sherry just seemed to disappear out of thin air and there were no leads, the police had to really consider every possible scenario. And of course, one of those scenarios is that the husband did it. It's kind of the classic possibility with true crime cases. And Keith knew that he could be considered a suspect, so he volunteered to take a polygraph test and he passed it just fine. But one of the reasons why they were still a little suspicious of Keith was because of the way that the phone was found. It looked almost staged. I mean, I want your guys' opinion on this. It doesn't really look like it was dropped or thrown by Sherry in, you know, fear. It looks like it was kind of propped up there on purpose. And there were investigators who even looked at it and said that this looks kind of staged. However, a lot of people who knew Keith said publicly on social media and stuff, trying to shut down rumors that were already starting to go, that Keith would never do something to his wife. Even Sherry's family came forward and said that they trusted Keith 100%, that there's just no way he would do anything to her. And Keith truly seemed desperate to find his wife, like he would do anything. And at one point he even hired a psychic. Psychics can be very controversial in true crime cases. There has been instances of psychics actually helping, but there's been more instances of them making the situation worse or telling the family information that's just straight up not true. But anyway, they met with the psychic and absolutely nothing came out of it. So after Sherry had been gone for a couple weeks, there was this man visiting the area in California that they lived. He was visiting a friend in town and he happened to see all of this on TV. He actually saw that recording of Keith sobbing and begging the public to help. And this man actually happened to be a very wealthy entrepreneur. And Keith's story touched him so much that he decided to help. He decided to offer what is called a reverse ransom. He put up a $50,000 reward to Sherry's kidnappers for her safe return. But of course the deal would have to be that she was completely unharmed. And this guy remained completely anonymous. He didn't want any recognition for this. He just wanted to help. And this man actually told the sheriff's office about his plan before he did it. And they actually were really hesitant and did not want him to put up this reward. They thought that it could possibly damage the investigation, but he decided he wanted to do it anyway. And he got in touch with Keith through a mutual friend. And Keith was really happy to have him, although he was really hoping for someone to speak publicly and to offer a reward publicly. And this guy wanted to remain anonymous. So this is when he ended up connecting with another guy named Cameron Gamble. And this was through a mutual friend. Cameron is a former pilot in the Air Force and a captivity survival expert. He works from an undisclosed location where he set up four large shipping containers to represent different places around the world where people are 
are frequently held hostage. These containers mimic real life scenarios that people experience behind enemy lines. Cameron actually keeps this place a secret so that victims can come to him privately. And it's pretty amazing what this guy actually does. He travels all over the world to aid in negotiation efforts and release hostages and victims of kidnappings. So Cameron and Keith and that anonymous donor meet up to discuss a plan. And Cameron ended up being the face to the media, offering the reward and talking about their demands. And the media, as well as the police, actually criticized Cameron for his involvement in the case. A lot of people thought he was actually being an opportunist, only trying to promote his own business because the case was getting a lot of coverage. You go into these situations thinking they're dead, uh -huh. then you lose hope right off the bat. I don't do this for the critics. I do this for the small number that actually matter, and, and that being Keith and Sherry. And some people were accusing him of lying about his military background. And this is really weird, but I guess early in Cameron's career, he had created this kidnapping video, like a staged kidnapping video with a victim that looked a lot like Sherry. This video actually surfaced to the public and a lot of people found it very suspicious. There are so many rumors around this case, especially when it was all going down. And at the time, tons of people accused Cameron's wife of starring in pornos with Sherry Papini. Very, very strange, but Cameron actually had to come forward and deny that his wife even knew Sherry. It was very odd. There was just so much controversy around this case because people were very skeptical about Keith. But according to Cameron, he did not do this for his business. He just truly wanted to help Keith and help get Sherry back. So eventually Cameron put out a video talking about the $50,000 reverse ransom. He said, no questions asked. As long as you bring her back safely, then you will get the money. Bring her home, bring her home. Just bring her home. Bring her home safe. There's a $50,000 reward. Bring her home. And what was interesting is he actually gave a 100 hour deadline, which not many people put deadlines on rewards, but when they do, it's so that they can get some results faster and put pressure on the possible kidnappers to show them that they can't just wait as long as they want to give the person back. Eventually 100 hours passed and nothing came out of it. So the anonymous donor decided to double that amount and Cameron made another video talking about a $100,000 reward this time. So they put out another reverse ransom for $100,000 this time and waited. And this was on November 23rd. The next day was November 24th, 2016. It was Thanksgiving morning. That morning, Keith actually had plans to release balloons with the community to help raise awareness about Sherry. But about 4 a.m. that morning, there was this woman named Allison driving with her daughter on the highway. The two of them had actually already been traveling for about eight hours and they happened to see this woman on the side of the road. This woman was standing extremely close to traffic. She was frantic, clearly terrified, trying to flag down someone. And at first glance, Allison knew that something was wrong with this woman. She had dirt all over her face, which ended up being bruises. She could just tell that this woman was highly disturbed and very, very scared. But she wasn't sure where she was and she was worried that this might be some type of trap. I mean, it's 4 a.m., it's still dark out. So she continues driving a little bit, pulls over and just calls 911 from her car. I was in the right hand lane and I saw a woman frantically waving what looked like a shirt trying to flag somebody down. She had like a wide eyed, panicked kind of look. I was startled to see her. It was dark and she pretty much just came out of nowhere. If I had swerved to the right the least little bit, I would have hit her with my car. I figured if she was willing to risk being hit by a car, trying to get somebody's attention that she must really need some help. I pulled off and I dialed 911. This was in an area called Yolo County and the police department got the call and quickly headed to Allison. However, Allison was concerned and she did have her daughter with her. So she decided to just go ahead and keep driving. And the dispatcher assured her that someone would come and make sure that the woman was okay. So the police got there. And as you probably guessed, this woman was Sherry Papini. She was about 150 miles from home and it had been 22 days since she first went missing. EMS said that they found Sherry covered with bruises, dried blood, and she actually had been chained up. She had a chain around her waist that connected to her wrist, and she actually had zip ties around her ankles and hose clamps. Sherry was also very underdressed for November. It was freezing outside, and not only that, she had lost a ton of weight. You could classify her as almost emaciated. Police pulled up security camera footage for a local church, 
and they actually saw Sherry on video running around frantically trying to flag someone down. In the video, she actually ran up to the church. She ran up to another building as well, I believe a house, before she decided to go back to the road. And she was not getting any luck getting help actually, because I think a lot of people were freaked out or thinking, you know, what's wrong with this woman? It's the middle of the night. It's kind of dangerous to pull over. And she says that she was worried that people weren't pulling over because she had chains and she thought maybe they thought she had escaped from prison. So Sherry, of course, was rushed to a nearby hospital to be looked at, and she was so upset that she could barely recall what had happened, she could barely speak, and it would be months before she would explain to police what all had happened to her. And there was a lot of criticism at Sherry for this, the fact that she couldn't recall a lot of details, but this is very, very common for someone who goes through trauma. A lot of victims who are held captive or something else happens to them have trouble recalling calling details of the events, have trouble putting together a timeline, and can even suffer from short-term memory loss. And this is a natural defense mechanism that our brain has to deal with trauma. Sometimes your brain can completely black something out to help protect you from reliving the trauma over and over. And even though it took a while for Sherry to recall all of the details of what she had been through, Sherry always cooperated fully with the police. The Shasta County Sheriff's Office Major Crimes Unit continues to dedicate all of its resources to identifying and apprehending those individuals who are responsible for the abduction of Sherry Papini. Over the last two days, major crime detectives have interviewed Sherry at an undisclosed location. The interviews were very intense for both the investigators and for Sherry due to her having to relive this traumatic event. She was cooperative and courageous during the interviews. There's still a lot of unknowns about her assailants. However, we commend Sherry for her efforts to sit down with our detectives and provide a statement. So Sherry didn't have any serious injuries. She said that at one point she hurt her foot, but they checked it out and it looked okay. However, she did lose about 15% of her body weight, which is quite a bit in just 22 days. And she did have a bit of a broken nose just on the bridge of her nose. And like I said, her face and her whole body were covered in bruises. And the bruises on her body were not fresh as in made in the last couple of days. Some of them were, but a lot of them were old and they were kind of layered onto her. So it showed that she had had multiple beatings over her 22 days that she was gone. And it also looked like she had been bound for quite a long amount of time. She had deep gashes into her neck and marks on her wrist from where she had been bound. And what's really crazy is Sherry actually had a branding on her body. It was on her shoulder. And at this point it had been kind of scabbed over and there's not any pictures of it or details as to what the branding was of, but that's very, very scary. Not only that, her beautiful blonde hair had been chopped above her shoulders and was all chunky and messed up, which police say oftentimes people who abduct others and want to use them in some way will do this to kind of take away their control or embarrass them or almost steal their identity in a way. Of course, they took DNA samples from Sherry and they found a woman's DNA as well as a man's DNA on her body. So while all this is happening and Sherry is being examined at the hospital, they start calling Keith and they tell him that Sherry is alive. Keith goes to the hospital as quickly as he can. And when he gets there, an officer kind of embraces him and tells him to be prepared to see her. You know, it's great that she's alive, be happy, but she's in rough condition and it could be hard for you to see. And when he pulled back that hospital curtain, he said it was extremely overwhelming for him to be excited to see her alive, but also see her in such a terrible condition. He immediately embraced her and they sobbed together and he, checked out all of her bruises and scabs and was just horrified by what he saw. He said it was the most overwhelming feeling of both excitement and happiness and also nausea and disgust. Just ran past everybody and I, you know, throw up in the curtain and she was there in a, in a bed and her poor face. And I just hugged her, I just held her. I felt like I hugged her for like 20 minutes. I was so happy that she was there and, and I was just kissing her all over and then I got like nauseated just looking at her. It was so hard for me to see her 
like that. Soon it was announced to the public that Sherry was found and people were super, super relieved. Sherry's sister, Sheila, made a statement for the family thanking the community for all of their help, as well as law enforcement's help in bringing Sherry home. And they ended up having that balloon release ceremony that they had planned, except for they you know, launched them in celebration for Sherry returning home. So like I said, over the next few months, Sherry starts telling the police more about what happened to her and recalls some details. Sherry actually described her kidnappers as two women, two Hispanic women who mostly spoke Spanish. So she really didn't know what was going on most of the time. She knew a couple details about them. Like one of them had earrings and curly hair that was pulled back into a bun and thin eyebrows. But she said for the most part, they covered their faces when they were around her. And a lot of the time they had a bag over Sherry's head. She said one of the women was about 20 to 30 years old and one was older, maybe 40 to 50, but she really had no idea. Eventually more details came back to her. She remembered one of them having long, straight, dark hair and bushy eyebrows, but that was about it. Police said that for over the three weeks that Sherry was gone, she was held in a dirty little cell. And during this time she was treated very, very terribly and was tortured by these women. They said that she was beaten multiple times, that she was starved and kept in chains at all times. It was during one of these beatings that they broke her nose and they cut off her hair and they at some point branded her. Sherry said that she missed her children so much while she was gone that she would hold a piece of blanket that she had or a piece of clothing or whatever she could find and pretend it was a baby and like rock it to comfort her. It's really sad to think about. Acting like she was tucking in her kids and she told me one time she took some piece of cloth and rolled it up like it was violet. She would rock it. She's so strong. So why did they let her go? Well, according to Sherry, the day that they let her go, she heard the two women arguing and then she heard a gunshot and then one of the women came in and took her in the car. This woman then took her to County Road 17 and that's where she dumped her off. Again, this was 150 miles from where she originally was taken. Sherry couldn't believe that she was just dumped out on the side of the road. And at this point she still had a bag on her head. So she tried to take that off. She tried to move and at first she couldn't even get up because her legs hurt so bad. But according to her, she managed to get the bag off of her head. And as soon as she got up on her feet, she just ran ran to a nearby church, then to that house, and then just ran to the road to try to see if she could flag anyone down. And that's when Allison found her and then police quickly came after. Sherry was extremely happy to be home with her kids. And I said, you know what, buddy? I found mom. And he, <laughs> he got the biggest grin and he started like, you know, like, where is she? <laughs> and he just sprinted 100 miles an hour. I was like, go slow, go slow. And he hugged her and my wife obviously very emotional and started crying and she said, I'm so happy. And my son, of course, is like, you don't cry when you're happy. And, and uh, my wife said, when you're this happy, you cry. She picked her up and then again, just snuggles and kisses. My son jumped in my arms, we were hugging. And then of course we all went to the ground for a big family hug. So of course it's great that Sherry has now returned home, that she's safe with her kids and her husband. Keith is very, very happy, but the public still had a lot of questions and rumors really began swirling at this point. People were already kind of sketched out by Keith for some reason. There were already rumors about him possibly being involved from the beginning. But the police believed Sherry in the whole situation and their concern was the fact that there are kidnappers still out there. They actually gave a formal warning to the community to be cautious and that there are possible abductors out there. Sherry to this day has never publicly spoken about her disappearance, but over time, more and more details have come out and it has made people question the case even more. The public still had a lot of questions that they wanted answered about this case. I mean, why was she just let go? Who were these people? And then there was, of course, people questioning the entire thing. So it wasn't until almost a year after her abduction that Sherry was able to pull enough information on her kidnappers for them to create a sketch. The police released these sketches to the public and they started wondering if 
this possibly had anything to do with drugs because there were a lot of meth houses in the area. The police looked at a ton of possibilities. There were actually a lot of sexual offenders in that area as well. So they did over 20 search warrants of people's homes. They checked people's cell phone records, their bank accounts, their social media. They put a lot of time into this investigation and were desperate to figure out who took Sherry. Almost a year after everything had happened, the police ended up releasing more information to the public because at this point they didn't even know that there was DNA found on Sherry. So that was revealed as well as a little bit of the evidence from the search warrant that they conducted. And as police release more evidence, things just started to become more confusing and a lot of people brought up even more questions. One thing that threw people off was about Sherry's foot because she had claimed that she had injured her foot but there wasn't actually an injury found and she said you know she couldn't even walk at first when they first threw her out of the car. Um, but then she didn't actually have an injury, so people were very skeptical about that. Also, people were confused about why there was male DNA on her body when Sherry had said that there were two female abductors. However, a lot of information was still being held from the public at this point, including if there was DNA from any body fluids or hair, and there was a lot of suspicion around Keith. Even the media was questioning whether this was possibly hoaxed by the two of them, but there was really no information coming from Sherry at this point. They had really shut down and were laying low. And I think this made people even more curious. And around this same time, police released some very interesting information. They said that before all of this had happened, Sherry had a texting relationship going on with another man from Detroit, Michigan. And they ended up serving 12 search warrants on this person in Michigan. There's not a lot of details as to why, and I'm sure there is more information out there, but a lot of people in the public started wondering why they even released this information to begin with. It seems like they thought it was important enough to tell people about. So it definitely makes you wonder why they think that. Apparently Sherry had known this man for years and they had just started texting again right around the time of her disappearance. And they kept talking regularly until late October, 2016, right before she went missing in November. And I just think it's interesting that the police put this out there. I mean, they know that people are speculating about this case. They know that there is some suspicion around these people. So releasing something like this is only gonna make that worse. And they must have known what they were doing. They didn't explain whether this relationship was platonic or you know romantic and there have been no messages released so we can't really make that determination for ourselves but they did say that sherry had planned to meet up with him in person however this man was investigated and according to police he was cleared of any involvement in sherry's disappearance the dna samples that were found on sherry were also uploaded to codis the fbi's combined dna index system and no matches were found they also tried to using some genetic genealogy websites because the dna database will only come back if it's a direct match but the genealogy websites with data that is pulled from like Ancestry and 23andMe shows second, third cousins, you know, other people in your family, and then they can work backwards and find the original person. This is some newer technology. However, we don't know if they ended up finding anything. It's possible that they did pull some other family and they just are keeping that quiet because this case is still under investigation. Now, obviously I've said that there is a lot of public opinion when it comes to this case, of people thinking that it could all be hoaxed, but it's not just people assuming this. There's also some experts that think this as well. For example, Ken Ryan, who is a law enforcement expert and criminology professor with 25 years of experience, publicly expressed that he has doubts that Sherry was actually kidnapped. He said that he was amazed by the coincidences and he finds it highly unlikely that the perpetrators would be two women in a kidnapping and torture case and that they would be able to just get away with the crime. He's actually quoted saying, in my 25 years, I've never seen a case like this where someone was kidnapped, held captive for 20 something days and then just released. None of it makes sense. A lot of people have called for Sherry to have a polygraph test. However, the police have never wanted to make a victim of a possible kidnapping do a polygraph test. So to this day, she's never done one. Investigators seem to be more on Sherry's side, although there could be more information that they are keeping, but they said that her story doesn't need to be completely logical to be true. Sometimes crimes really are illogical and it doesn't always make sense. The mayor of Redding, California, Brent Weaver, has gone on record saying that he doesn't doubt Sherry's version of events. He emphasized the importance of showing compassion to victims of violent crimes and expressed how sorry he feels for the Papini family. A lot of people argue that there's just no way that Sherry could have branded herself. I mean, that's pretty intense to brand yourself. 
That's extremely painful. And it would have been really hard because it was done on her right shoulder. So it'd be like, I don't know, unless someone else did it. Like I said, they never revealed what the branding actually was. They said it wasn't a symbol though. It was some type of message. And police don't think this is that unusual that kidnappers sometimes will do stuff like this. Allison Sutton, the woman who found Sherry on the side of the road was interviewed as well. And she said that there is no reason that she believes that Sherry would be making this up and she doesn't doubt her at all. I, I would imagine that by now you are aware of, uh, I guess it's, it would be safe to characterize it as skepticism. Um, that a lot of folks have uh, about uh, some of the details of, of the story. What do you make of that skepticism? Um, I think it's unfounded. Um, I did catch a glimpse of her face as I drove past her and she looked frantic and terrified when I saw her. I just, I do not believe that there's any reason to be skeptical of her story. Um, she was out in very cold weather in not warm enough clothes, and I just cannot imagine someone going to those kind of extreme lengths. However, in March of 2017, the Sacramento Bee published an article that had concerning details about Sherry's past. It said that back in 2000, when Sherry was just a teenager, her sister, Sheila, said that Sherry had tried to break into their house through the back door, but nothing was stolen. And her father, Richard, also said some questionable stuff about her and said that that same day, Sherry had vandalized their house. And it's interesting that the family has even come forward with this information. I mean, if they really thought she was a victim, I don't think they would be saying all of this. In 2003, Richard also reported an unauthorized bank withdrawal to the police and it ended up being Sherry. At this time, she was only 21 years old and she did eventually return the money to her father. A few months after this, this, Sherry's mother Loretta had called the police because she said that Sherry had been hurting herself and was threatening to blame her mother for it when the police came. A lot of people have questioned how long she took to divorce David when she got together with Keith and was already living with him. And some people think that she was doing it to continue to stay on his military benefits. But at the end of the day, these events may not be completely accurate and they haven't been commented on by Sherry herself. And a lot of people argue that they really have nothing to do with her being kidnapped 10 years later. It's very possible that Sherry was struggling with mental health during those times. And just because someone has mental health issues doesn't mean that they staged a violent crime. I mean, there is physical evidence here. She was bruised. It showed weeks of bruising. Her hair was cut. She was branded. And not only that, she lost 15 pounds. I mean, that's quite a lot of work to stage something like that. And where would she have been during all of that? The rumors online, started getting really bad and they're bad to this day. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you think that Sherry faked all of this and it's possible. I'm not saying she didn't. I don't really know at the end of the day what to think of this case, but if you go to YouTube videos on this or Reddit, there's a huge group of people that really believe that this was staged by the couple, that possibly they wanted to do this for some type of reality TV show, which I don't know if that makes any sense because they were super private before all this happened and it's not like anyone else in the past has gotten a reality TV show from going missing. And having this article come out in the Sacramento Bee that was just questioning it even more, the Papini family ended up making a statement for the first time in a while. It said, Sherry Papini and her family are the very recent victims of an extremely violent crime that has painfully and dramatically changed the course of their lives forever. It's shameful that a media outlet would intentionally exploit Sherry and Keith Papini and their young children's trauma for the sole purpose of clickbait and selling papers. Papers. This newspaper's decision to aggressively seek out and publish online activity and distort phone conversations from 16 years ago is victim blaming. It is our hope that the media will honor their privacy as they work through this difficult time. To this day, Sherry's case is still open and active and the FBI is still working on it. No one has ever been charged, no one's ever been arrested, and that cash reward is actually still up for grabs. For a while after the kidnapping, Sherry and her family actually had to stay in their home because they were being harassed by people in the public, accusing them of making this all up. Neighbors say that they occasionally see Keith out driving, but Sherry and her kids stay in the house most of the time, which is incredibly sad. I can't imagine if this really did happen to her, okay? And I know there is a possibility that this is hoaxed. That does happen. But if she really was kidnapped 
and went through this terrible ordeal and she returns home and a lot of the public greets her with criticism and suspicion and says she's making it up. I mean, that has gotta be the most depressing thing ever. But on the other hand, people do sometimes hoax kidnappings. It does happen. I've talked about a recent hoax kidnapping on my podcast twice now of Hannah Potts. Just a couple weeks ago, this girl literally staged her whole kidnapping with two other weirdos and like hid in a house and put out this bizarre message on Facebook saying that she was kidnapped by this black guy in a maroon car and she was being held somewhere and turns out this entire thing was hoaxed by her because she wanted to write a book. So it's not unheard of for people to fake this type of thing for I guess attention and clout, but I just don't feel like there's enough to say that Sherry faked this and be so confident about it. Sherry still hasn't talked to the media at all. She's actually afraid of the media and afraid of people. She was literally stalked like a celebrity for a while. Random people would be taking pictures of her every time that she would leave the house. It's just messed up. The family has gotten so much backlash and hate that they ended up having to move. They live now in an undisclosed location. And a lot of people were really angry about that GoFundMe that Keith started. And they believed that that was part of their scam, that they just wanted to raise money. However, the family claimed that even though they didn't end up using it for a private investigator, they instead used it for Sherry's recovery, for physical and mental health. Keith has said that his wife is not doing well and all of the speculation has just made it so much worse. She has been seeing a therapist and is trying to work through all her trauma and fear of strangers, which I can't imagine. Former FBI special agent Brad Garrett said in an interview that he believes that Sherry's case could be solved by DNA or other forensic evidence. He's theorized that there could be additional video evidence or unknown witness who has yet to come forward. There's a lot of theories about what could have happened. Obviously there's a the theory that the couple faked this together to get attention. There's a theory that Sherry just faked it, that maybe she wanted to leave her life and you know run away with someone else or just was sick of being a mom. I don't know. But eventually she changed her mind and decided to come home and make it all look like a staged kidnapping. Maybe it's possible that Keith didn't know about it and Sherry just faked it. But of course, the large majority of people believe that she actually was kidnapped. A lot of people bring up the idea of human trafficking. Sometimes victims of human trafficking are branded, so that was a possibility. However, some investigators have pointed out normally when you are trafficking someone, you want them to look their best so that you can go and sell them. It doesn't really make sense for them to bruise her so badly, not feed her, and cut her hair all off. This is where we believe Sherry was taken from. But private investigator Bill Garcia has his suspicions. He worked with Papini's family during her disappearance, but isn't involved with the sheriff's investigation. As a veteran of human trafficking cases, he believes Papini's has the telltale signs. I suspect based on the types of injuries that uh, Sherry incurred, the beatings, uh, the broken nose, the cut hair, uh, especially the chains and the branding indicate that it was most likely one of these sex trafficking groups. There's another theory that Sherry was abducted into a drug cartel and used as some type of bait or some type of ransom. Some operations actually use victims that they have kidnapped to lure in other women. Experts say the area near where Papini was abducted, known as the Emerald Triangle, is a hotbed for drug cartels and sex rings. In early 2017, two Hispanic women were arrested south of Sacramento on suspicious sex trafficking. A lot of people thought maybe it was related. This area in Redding is a very dangerous area for women and has been proven multiple times to be dangerous. Some people believe that Sherry has told the police a lot more than they are revealing. Some people believe that she is keeping things from the police because she was threatened to remain quiet. There's been no other updates to this case. It's possible that more might come out later because this is still open. The Papinis have been totally quiet. I think there is probably more that they have discussed with law enforcement. There's probably a lot that we don't know at this point. They have not made any other statements though, and I think they are planning to lay low. I'm not sure if this will ever be solved, uh, but I wanna know your thoughts below. I know you guys are gonna have very differing opinions and that's okay. Just please be kind when expressing and you know sharing your thoughts with others in the comment section. But before I go, I wanna take a second to thank our sponsor, Raycon. Now, if you've never heard of Raycon, they are wireless earbuds that fit 
right in this cute little compact case and they also charge right in there, which is so convenient. They're very stylish, comfortable, they have amazing sound and the best part is they have a great affordable price. The model that I have here are the Everyday E25s. They're fantastic. They have six hours of play time, seamless Bluetooth pairing. And even though these guys are small, they really pack a punch. They have a ton of bass and they also come in a few colors, which is awesome. So you can express yourself with your earbuds. I love to wear my earbuds when I listen to my podcasts or YouTube videos on the go. And the best part is they start at just half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. So go check it out today at buyraycon.com slash Kendall Ray to get 15% off of your order. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash Kendall Ray. Thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. And that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're all having a great day. Stay safe and I will see you next week.